next speaker is uh, Martin Harper, <laughs> Director of Conservation for the RSPB. Uh, I'm impressed with his qualifications, studied at Oxford, University College London, um, and interested to know that he was stimulated to take up a sort of a career in wildlife by his mum, who was, uh, I think, a biology teacher. Looking at my two sons, they've done the complete opposite to me uh, and uh, my wife, so I'm impressed that uh, your mum inspired you. Um, he's a prolific <coughs> blogger, if you've looked at the RSP website, uh, and a regular contributor to the Today programme as well, if you're up early. I think you're on earlier in the week about fracking. <coughs> Um, when he's not busy blogging, broadcasting, or working, he likes to spend his uh, spare time pottering around East Anglia or in Northumberland, where I think he likes to chase wildlife and find castles with his wife and children. Martin, the floor is yours. Uh, thanks very much indeed. Um, so yes, I am one of those middle-class, liberal, lily-livered people who are part of the NGO establishment, uh, and uh, I apologise on, um, on that. Uh, I'm also an interloper, and obviously not from Devon, quite interested in the flatlands where I live. Um, but I did try and get, you know, find, tap into my inner Devonian soul yesterday by going on to Dartmoor and getting absolutely great. <laughs> so I feel slightly more authentic giving a talk today uh, about really the role of species recovery. So what I wanted to do really was to start off by doing what Stephen did, which is to congratulate the lead um, authors and indeed everyone involved in the Atlas. Um, for producing this extraordinary work, which I've actually seen some of the headlines, um, thanks to Kevin Cox previously, but also to congratulate you on having this conference, because this conference is partly a celebration of what you've done, but it's also trying to say what you need to do in order to have a better future for Devon Birds, and I think that was that's a great thing to do, uh, and I wish that all the other bird societies across the um, United Kingdom do the same thing, because it's about how you use the information that makes a difference. Um, because actually what you're detecting is change, and the context for my work and any involved, involved in conservation at the moment is, is how do you understand, interpret, and respond to change? And so the big context for us um, in the nature conservation sector at the moment is pretty much what David Attenborough um, described when he was helping to launch our State of Nature publication in 2013, which he basically described as the doomsday publication for nature. We are a nation of naturalists. We're very good at collecting information about what's happening to our natural world. Uh, and this state of nature publication um, really, I think, has become a common evidence base for all of us involved in nature conservation to say, well, OK, given that's the state of nature, what do we do about it? And we had two very strong headline statistics here, which related to all the species for which we had trend information, 60 tenths of species um, declined in 40 years, about 1 in 10 at risk of extinction. Actually really similar if you looked at the changes that were presented earlier uh, about what's happening in Devon um, and regarding its birds. Very similar to the stats. But if you just stop and think, and I, I have suddenly become very personal when I think about this because I was born in 1970, and nearly all the trend graphs relating to wildlife, and particularly birds, they start declining, you know, 1970. I know they mask the, the historic declines. So every time you see a graph which starts in 1970 and see the declines, Farmer Bird Index came out the other day, you feel really guilty because this has all happened in my lifetime. Uh, and, um, and I think if you just start and think about the scale of change, the scale of flux, of course, 40% of species going up, exactly the same in the bird atlas, that amount of change and upheaval, um, is, it, it makes you fearful about what will happen over the next three to four decades. So part of my talk today, I think, is to give a bit of optimism to explain to is to say what can be done. I'm happy to give you a bit of a steer as to what could be done down here in Devon. And I think one of the reasons to be cheerful is this is the collaboration of organisations who are involved in the state of uh, nature reports. So uh, down here you've got wonderful participation from all of your um, Devon birding community. And for that state of nature report, we drew upon um, the information that's held by the likes of Q, BTO, uh, other organisations like the BRC, to try and come together and say, you know what, let's interpret the data we have and then try and work out what we need to do about it. And this graph is its first ever airing. 
And we heard um, earlier uh, a, a, a little bit of description about what might be happening to Devon birds. So the um, word of warning about this is this is currently uh, in prep, it's subject to peer review, but it hopefully will be published um, in uh, a journal quite soon. And what it basically is trying to say is what are the relative drivers that are, that are, that are, making, that are leading to those changes in species? So we looked at um, a huge number of species from State of Nature and said, what do we think are the biggest reasons for change? And on the um, right-hand side is the negative drivers of change, um, and on the left-hand side are the positive drivers of change. I won't be necessarily read them all, but you're not allowed to, because this is a, um, it's exclusive. Um, two, two or three things I'm going to pull out. Firstly, uh, and I apologise to my deadly farmer friend, um, but so intensive management associated with, 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 with agriculture, uh, perhaps understandably, it has come out as the biggest reason for, for, for change. Some positive side as well. I'll come back to climate. Climate here is perhaps a, a positive um, uh, uh, driver of change. Almost certainly because we know the species of the marsh northwards, arguably UK becoming more of an arc for species um, in, in due course. We're going to have great responsibility to look after species which are on the marsh. But this is the one I wanted to point to you at, because I think Stephen um, flagged this one. This is showing there's a positive change um, brought about through habitat creation. And I think one of the great things that's happened over the last um, probably two decades is that we've got stuck into habitat creation. We began to rebuild some of the habitats which is allowing species to adapt. So anyway, um, that analysis is going to be published soon, and it gives us an indication of the drivers of change. So we know about strength, we know about the drivers, and what we've started to do is try and compile what we think needs to be done. So this is um, a list of actions which we presented to the four administrations across the UK, four separate country reports, and there's a nice list of actions here. All quite traditional stuff. Anyone who's been um, involved in um, anything to do with policy will recognise um, some of the words about visions, about goals, about implementing laws. But the thing I want to focus on is the saving, safeguarding species. Because you have been compiling um, a report all about what's happening to species. And for us in the RSPB, the key illustration of success in conservation or failure is what's happened to species. They are the currency by which we judge our success. So that's what I'm going to focus on in this talk. And the good news is, is it's not just us in this country, but also globally, there's still a recognition that, you know what, we should actually be trying to reduce the extinction risk of species. So this text, a bit long-winded, but the world is about extinction of species um, by 2020, um, this comes from the Global Convention on Biological Diversity, and it's one of the 20 targets that was agreed in a place called Nagoya in Japan in, um, in 2010. And so the world conservation community has signed up to these targets, including the United Kingdom, and by the end of this decade, we are meant to have pretty much prevented extinction. Um, <laughs> So, anyway, so the good news is people have committed to try to do that. So the question is, okay, how do we encourage people to take that on? So the RSPB, um, and I'm going to be talking about what the RSPB um, has done in partnership with others. I'm going to explain a little bit of our approach um, to species recovery and say a little bit about where we work. So this is uh, essentially a relatively new map showing where the RSPB is interested in working. <coughs> And it looks like quite a large bit of the world. Uh, and, you know, the RSPB can come from a bit arrogant, a bit big for its boots and all of that. But the reality is, if we are interested in saving the birds on this small set of islands called the United Kingdom, then, of course, we've got to be interested in the flyways. And so all of our, you know, wintering wildfowl coming in from the north and our summer migrants coming from the south, we've got to be interested in what's happening in those places. And we've also got to be, we think, responsible and interested in what's happening to our overseas territory. These 14 splodges uh, on this map, of which the United Kingdom has responsibility. And it's home to more threatened species than Madagascar. So uh, a large part of the United Kingdom threatened wildlife obviously resides in those over ter overseas territories. And the blue stretches across the, um, the bottom, a little bit up there, relate to global seabirds, including albatrosses. So the range of those species, a lot of which nest on the islands, which UK also still calls home. Uh, so what we do is we look at all of the problems associated with species in the world, uh, when we think about where we want to have impact, and then we select some priorities. 
So this slide simply says that we um, try to um, help the fortunes, conservation fortunes, of 101 bird species and 83 that don't have feathers, uh, but we also have commitments to about 32 elsewhere. So we've had to select which species we're prepared to um, uh, allocate our finite conservation resources. And then what we do, this is a bit of a complicated slide coming up, we then say, we then say, how are we going to drive their recovery? So we call this our species recovery curve. Uh, and I thought I'd just share this with you because it gives you an indication of the approach that we adopt in our organisation for trying to get the population numbers of threatened species up. So it's four real stages. We monitor what's going on, choose our species, and we diagnose why that species might be declining. We then go out and test some solutions. Uh, and then what we try to do is roll out that solutions with others. And of course, our nirvana we're hoping to uh, move towards is sustainable management of species. And this pretty much established as a way of thinking in the early 80s um, from the RSPB um, stuff. It's still very much driving our thinking today. Uh, and I'm gonna, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk to you about five Devonian birds. Well, they're birds, but some spend some of the time in Devon. Uh, and, um, um, so cell bunting, max shear water, wood warbler, ring oozel, and doctor warbler. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to just tell the story about the work we've been doing often with you, Devon Birds, uh, and, and others. Um, and I'm going to say what we're going to do, what we've done, what we've achieved, and what happens <coughs> next. And it'd be worth saying that they're all at different points in this recovery curve. So I'm going to start off by talking about cell buntings, and what I'll say is that you know we're getting there. Um, we think we've made real progress in terms of driving up the population, but we are not yet in a position where we can let go, uh, and we don't think we've got the real sustainable management. So we've made huge progress. Um, what I'll say about Mag Shear Water is that um, we think we know what needs to be done, we just yes, haven't um, rolled out the solution across all of its range. What I'll say about Dartford Warbler, we'll say this is at the earliest stage, and we've still got a huge amount of action to take place before we can be confident um, that it's going to be um, got a, got a certain future. Ring Oozle, we sort of know what needs to be done, confident enough to be able to trial some solutions, and I'll come back to the work we're doing on Dartmoor, whereas Wood Warbler, unfortunately, is still a bit of a head, head case. We don't really know what's driving the decline, um, which is why we've got to really um, do some more research. So I'm going to use these five to illustrate the sort of things that we do with species recovery, which hopefully um, will help um, Devon's birds in the future. Uh, and um, this is um, a very messy map of sort of the RSPB's interest in Devon. We love all of Devon, obviously, and all of my colleagues from the RSPB here live and work here, um, love all of Devon, but this was quite educational for me. I was quite interested to know, so which bits of Devon are we really interested in? Um, and the, um, the blue bits are nature reserves, uh, and then the, the sort of pinkish splodge, um, that's what we call our, our farm advice area. Uh, and then uh, what we've got here is the ranges. You can see there's a, there's a legend here, but a blue range, for example. Well, hang on a second. Yeah, the wood warbler range is pretty much all of, of Devon. And it gives you an indication that you know, we're interested in a lot of what goes on in Devon, but we've got to be quite targeted in the way that we feel as though we have had impact. Um, and there's you know, lots of great organisations in this room all trying to achieve what we want, which is um, a healthier natural environment. So. Um, that's where we want to have impact. So let's think about these five case studies. So the first one is perhaps um, you know, a, a great poster bird for um, conservation success and often talked about as one of the great um, uh, examples of why species recovery can be so successful. So here we are, um, cell bunting, uh, and the RSPB's involvement in this goes back to the late 80s, 18, uh, 1989, when I think it was um, accepted that the cell bunting population had got to such a low level, I think you, you suggested about 150 pairs or so, incredibly low level. And in 1993, that's when we established our um, cell bunting recovery um, project. And so, and we've been going at this for 22 years and counting. And, um, and this montage of slides really gives you an indication of what we've done. So we, we, we quickly understood the causes of decline, and they were highlighted in an earlier graph, particularly that switch from spring, spring sowing cropping to autumn sowing cropping, which is removing a lot of the available winter food. Um, that was a big driver of change. So how do we get winter food back into the farm landscape? Uh, and over the last 
20 years or so. Um, Kath Jeffs, many of you will perhaps know her, who's been the you know, lead RSPB driving force with this, um, has you know, worked with, I think, over 200 farmers uh, and has helped to get something like 100 um, uh, agro-environment schemes in place. And as a result of that work from those farmers and that funding scheme, so like 10,000 hectares of habitat being put into place full cell runs. Now, fantastic achievement over the last two decades. Uh, and this little slide here is just illustrative of the fact that you were very generous in giving up some of your Devon birds to go and help the, um, the poor Cornish cousins uh, benefit in terms of the translocation of cell runs. And, you know, again, hard work graft has led to us being confident that there's now a self-sustaining population of um, Devon birds in Cornwall. Uh, so they've got to about 50 pairs or so now. Um, and as a result of this, you can see that we've managed to turn down, turn down these declines. It stops at about 2009, because that was the last time we did a big species, a single species survey. And I'm absolutely delighted that um, uh, Devon birds has really helped to continue its support for this project by funding the next stage of a, a, monitor, um, a survey scheme to see whether we have actually exceeded the 1,000 pair threshold um, for, for cell lightings. Um, and, and, and I think that it's really important that we get that information because then we can celebrate um, the achievements of the farming community, work that Devon Birds, RSPB and other organisations have done to drive cell bunting's recovery. Um, and yeah, I mean, this, this, this graph down here, which I overlooked, I apologise, is, is just giving an indication of the number of pairs and the number of fledged broods. Um, and, and off it goes on the way up <coughs> relating to the, um, the Cornish site. So this is a great success story. Uh, and the translocation element is one of those tools in the conservation toolkit which we deploy elsewhere. So this nice montage of slides shows that actually it's okay to reintroduce species and it can really work. So whether it's cell bunting, corn crate, red kite, crane, white-tailed eagle, or even the short-haired um, uh, part of it, um, the reintroduction projects that we've been involved in over the last few years has been really dramatic. It's worked for these species. I uh, managed to get some um, first breeding cranes back into Stephen Moss's backyard uh, for the first time in 400 years. So uh, hopefully Stephen feels a bit better as a result of that. Um, so species recovery illustrated by the likes of um, uh, cell buntings, the role of translocation can work. Let's move, um, just let's hop over to Lundy, um, which you claim, I believe, as part of your patch. Um, and, and just wanted to talk about Max Shearwater a little bit and the work that the National Trust and ourselves and, and, um, have done over the last well, 15, 20 years, really. So Max Shearwater, many of you be aware, um, UK has huge responsibility for this species. We hold something like 80% of the total global population in the islands around sort of to the western bits of the United Kingdom. Um, but it's been really vulnerable to um, predation in its, um, uh, in its burrows uh, during breeding season because of the introduction of, of um, mammalian predators, usually um, rodents, brown and black rat, uh, and often introduced by humans. Uh, and um, the story at Lundy is one of um, success. Now, it may well be that Max Shearwater, a bit like cell buntings, actual range hasn't dramatically changed in the two atlas periods, but I'm pretty sure that the numbers have gone out, because um, as a result of Lundy being rat-free, we were able to report, I think it was last year, that there'd been a tenfold increase in the uh, number of uh, Max Shearwater on Lundy. And I think I read somewhere it's like 3,400 or so Max Shearwater now on, on Lundy, which is just staggering. Um, and it shows it would work. And it's not just Max Shearwater that's benefiting, Storm Petrel as well has also um, begun to breed. So that the, the action of removing the most <coughs> significant problem that an individual species faces has led to recovery. Uh, and that approach we uh, uh, have applied <coughs> off on the City Isles, which Cornwall claims, but why the late claim. Uh, and it's also what we're intending to do at the Shants up in Scotland as well. <coughs> So um, we, we're very confident that we're already getting a, a, ret a return on the investment of effort uh, in the Sillies, uh, already seeing some numbers um, of Max Shearwater um, go up, but we, can't we won't be able to report that those islands are rat-free until I think this Christmas, so we have to be a little bit cautious about 
celebrating success, because we have been tripped up before. This is one of those um, green splodges I showed earlier on the map. It's Henderson Island, one of our overseas territories. We try to eradicate rats from there to try and help threatened species like endemics like Henderson petrel, uh, and we failed. Uh, it's one of those projects which you know, we learned hugely from, which is the positive way of saying we're gutted, <laughs> uh, and, um, but it was a quite an expensive project, and you know, it, it, uh, we, we, we did actually buy some species time, um, and hopefully we, once we worked out what went wrong, we will go back. But we were also planning a, a, another a great adventure to the southern seas, and this is um, the endemic goth bunting, which is probably going to be the next globally extinct um, bird species, unless we deal with the nasty problem of... Um, mice eating birds alive. So this is one of the nastiest images uh, you can have in wildlife, which is, uh, it is um, these poor albatross chicks sitting there while the mice just devour them. And they've obviously evolved in the absence of predation. So their response mechanism to predation is not very good, is it? To just sit still and eat them alive. So, so, and so our challenge will be, can we remove mice from there? So um, the uh, impact of non-native invasive species is one of those four horsemen of the ecological apocalypse, and it is a problem that we have on our islands. Uh, and obviously, those of you who are interested in um, aqu aquatic plants, for example, will know the impact that non-natives can have in other systems as well. So, the first two examples. Let's move on to the third and then fourth. And I'm going to get into climate territory and perhaps I'll begin to answer one of the questions that was raised earlier about the impact of climate. So, let me just sort of describe this slide. Um, so back to lovely Dartford Warbler, uh, about to sing. Uh, Dartford Warbler uh, had a you know, d d disastrous time after the very, very cold winter of 62, 63, and the population shrank to a handful of pairs, um, pretty much left at, um, in Arn uh, in, um, in Dorset, and that was one of the triggers for the RSPB's involvement in Arn getting, getting that site in place. Uh, and since then, we've seen um, a dramatic recovery of, of this species and an expansion of its range until the really bad cold winters of 2011, 12, 13, I think, where we've seen numbers go down again. Um, and, and what I wanted to say here is, is really go back to the, my earlier points about what's happening with climate and the United Kingdom. These are two uh, climate um, maps which were produced by my colleague uh, Rhys Green in partnership with Durham University. Uh, produced a few years back, and they show the change in cl predicted climate range of all of the European breeding birds. So, for example, the um, blue blobs here is essentially the, the pre pre current predicted climate breeding range of dark warbler, uh, and you can see what happens on a mid-term warming scenario, where global temperatures go up three degrees beyond the pre-industrial levels. And there's two things to note on this bottom side, if you can see it at the back, um, is, is one thing is what's happening down in um, Spain, Iberia. Essentially, the southern edge of Dartford Warbler's range is being obliterated. But what's happening to its northern edge? Well, it, it looks like it's going to be colonizing most of, of, of Britain. The point about um, climate colonization will only work if the habitat which that species requires is in place. It will only work if they can find the available food. So there's a massive predict predictive shift so what do we do for species like Dartford Warbler? Well, one of the things which I think um, has been a great concerted effort for about the last 20 years or so has been um, trying to grow and expand the existing stock of heathland. So this is a map of England, a bit of Wales, and a tiny bit of Scotland, showing where the, the current extent of heathland is, and that's the green splodges, and where the potential areas for expansion might be, and that's the purple splodges. And the ambition for the conservation community over the last 20 years or so has been to try and extend the amount of heathland habitat. Because the, we have lost, we are something like 35, 36, I mean, pretty much most of the heathland habitat we had um, for, in, over the last 100 years or so. So the resource that the likes of Dartford Walker had, in order for it to move in the face of climate, is, is dependent on our ability to uh, put back lost heathland habitat. And you can see down here um, the ambitions around Dartmoor uh, and, and elsewhere to get more people and habitat back. So for species like Dartford Warbler, it is pretty clear. We just need to get more habitat in place so it can move through uh, the countryside, which is why the RSPB has done a huge amount of work getting trees off heath. Our own headquarters at the Lodge in Sandy, where I'm based, has been part of a big sort of 10, 15-year program of getting rid of the old plantation forest. 
and we've just managed to uh, uh, get a little bit of a foothold here in this lovely little complex around Sherwood, where we'll be working hopefully with the National Trust as part of Plumber Park <coughs> and elsewhere to try and get a big expansion of Heathland as part of that iconic landscape. And then we get to uh, you know a bit of a conservation conundrum like Ring Uzu. So um, you will know Ring Uzu well, uh, but what you may not necessarily be fully aware of of what the climate predictive maps are telling us about what's going to happen to Ring Uzu. So um, there it is, sort of clinging on down here. Um, but it's predict predicted to sort of move northwards, so a species that likes in a high high altitude. Uh, and so you might say. OK, the RSPB, are you going to give up on this species? Well, of course, the answer has to be no. Uh, and in a sense, that is why we're delighted to get the support of Devon Birds to support some of our ring oozle um, work. Because actually, we know what some of the problems that ring oozle are facing, and it's a combination of um, um, probably reduced predator pressure and also getting, um, uh, reducing disturbance. So we're in a position where thinking that we can cling on to perhaps the 10 pairs or so that, um, of, of ringers that go on Dartmoor. And it was quite sobering when I got very, very wet yesterday, um, walking um, on a bit of the moor, which just 10 years ago had six pairs of ring oozle. And that change is pretty dramatic on a species that obviously is, you know, it's, it's a real, real big totem of the uplands of, of Dartmoor. You want to keep them, we want to keep them. And so that's why we're, you know, with your support, investing in um, some exclusion fences to try and manage for disturbance. And hopefully that will buy this species time to be able to adapt and change. Uh, and I hope, actually, that the next time we do an atlas, that ring oozle is still clean. Well, why not? Uh, you know, we can't predict the future perfectly, so let's keep hold of ring oozle as long as we can. And then I move on to um, my final uh, case study, uh, which is wood warbler. And um, Malcolm Burgess is on the screen here, one of the lead researchers on this piece of work, again, working very heavily as a, you know, with the support of Devon birds. Uh, and just one of those cases, like actually a number of species stories I could tell, where the RSPB is just working through a whole load of hypotheses, understanding why this species is declining, and you know what, we don't know yet. So it might have been available habitat. We think we've ruled that out. It might have been, um, you know, reduction in productivity. We don't think that's an issue. Perhaps there was a phenological mismatch between the emergence of, you know, its prey um, during the breeding season. We don't think that's an issue. So on the breeding grounds, we are not sure um, that we know what the reasons are for decline. Um, and uh, this leads us to think, well, okay, there's something else going on. And I've just put in this little montage of slide to, to show that, um, as with other of our number of our woodland migrants, um, whether it's nightingale, cuckoo, or spotted fly, or pied flycatcher, uh, you know, the wood warbler has undergone pretty dramatic declines. And I think the 63% um, decline in abundance is very similar to your 70% <coughs> or so decline um, in, in the atlas. So the question is, um, what are the big drivers of change? And it might well be that what Stephen said earlier, Cuckoo's problem is on the breeding ground. It might well be the availability of um, you know, big hairy caterpillars, which is which is called a problem, or it might well be the available um, host host nesting site. Or, and this is a bit which I get onto with wood ball, it might be something to do with its flyway. Uh, and so this slide simply tries to say that um, actually for eight months of the year, wood warblers are going to be countering issues um, and other summer migrants, which has nothing to do with what happens in the UK. So eight months of the year spent away from the United Kingdom. So what we have to try and do is understand where the species are going, where are wood warblers going, um, what are they encountering on passage, so are they being shot at unsustainable levels, um, are there adequate stopover sites in places of northern Africa, uh, and then what's happening on their wintering grounds. And Malcolm can say more about this, but he's been heavily involved in this piece of work. His gut feeling is, it is what's happening on wintering grounds which is perhaps having an impact on wood warbler. Um, that contrasts with some of our other findings, which suggests, for example, that turtle doves and perhaps cuckoo, the principal reason for decline relates to pro um, their productivity on the breeding grounds. It goes back to what Stephen said, it's the food that's the problem. For wood warbler, it doesn't seem to be that. It might be what's going on in wintering grounds. And again, so how can you be confident and optimistic that wood warblers are going to feature in your Devon Atlas in 12 or 25 years' time? Well, that's when 
we are able to draw upon this incredible partnership that's called BirdLife International. Um, over 120 organisations, 10 million supporters worldwide, and lots of those partners are active in parts of the, um, the flyway. So we can be confident that we can do good work by our association with this extraordinary um, global partnership. So there you are, five case studies illustrative of the role of species recovery. Um, and I didn't want to jump over this one, which I did, uh, which essentially illustrates <coughs> the source of partners that help us and we work with. So there's a great big square here, of course, the much beleaguered natural England, but let's face it, are the guys who are actually providing a lot of the funding, the advice, the support, the scientific um, expertise to help drive many of these species recovery projects. Uh, and um, if it wasn't for our partnership with them, it, we would not be able to take the sort of action for Bird in England that we do now. Um, um, BTO, great supporter. Uh, these are some of the partners we work with um, uh, internationally. There's other agency here. And I have to say, one of the things we've been delighted about playing this tool has been um, just understand the breadth and scale of the, our partnership with Devon Birds and the amount of support that we get, both in terms of practical support, but also financial support. And I was delighted and very surprised that even in your objects as an organisation, you have the desire to provide practical and financial support for the RSPB Threatened Species Project. So thank you very much indeed. And I just want to close over the next couple of minutes um, with one, what are the main messages from all of this? <coughs> and then to say what else, what else? And that's to segue really into other speakers' talks. So my message to you is that targeted species recovery can work for individual species. I think cell buntings, manx shearwaters, and hopefully species like Dartford Walbert is a really good illustration of that. You can't do it on your own, so you have to work well with others, and that means getting the money in. Be led by the evidence. Don't chase your first hunch. If you chase your first hunch about the reason why these species are declining, you may well absolutely be spent wasting, throwing your money away, and um, you might miss the problem which is there still in front of you. So be led by the evidence, and that's why we are disciples um, of, of our species recovery approach. And then that allows you to direct resources to the right solutions. We would not currently be seeing the rise in the population of Asian vultures if we went with our hunches. It was only thanks to the Peregrine Fund that worked out the link between dicoconat as a veterinary drug for cattle that was poisoning the, the vultures. And only when they spotted that, allowed us to get rid of dicoconat as a veterinary drug, which has allowed vulture recovery to start. We were, ch we were chasing things like herbicide use, habitat and biodiversity, <coughs> competition with other prey. If we'd gone down that route, we would have lost vultures. So we target resources to the right solutions. Uh, and persistence. Um, you know, it's very easy to be excited and chase the new. Um, but I was chatting to Kath Jeffs when I was thinking about what's happened to Searles. You know, she's been involved in this since 1996. You know, that's nearly a career's work to try and get a species on, on, on the move. And one of the delightful things about working for um, you know, any institution, uh, like the RSBB or the Wildlife Trust, is that we don't go away. We're there for the long haul. Uh, and we have to, we will find out what's happening to Woodwall, but and we'll hopefully with others we'll find the wits and creativity to allocate resources to turn that around. But it's not going to be enough. On its own, target species recovery will not be enough. And so my little segue into, um, into the other species you might hear relates to so what else? Well remember, the target I was talking about from the HE targets, the global targets, was just number one, just one of them, 12. There are 20 of them. Here's another one. Lots of words about land. What does it mean in reality? Get a sixth of land and a tenth of seas well managed primarily for wildlife. That's what the global conservation community wants. Probably in the United Kingdom at the moment, only 5% of the whole of the United Kingdom is actually well managed for wildlife. My larger area protected areas, only 5% is well managed for wildlife. That is a big ambition. So let's focus on that. And that would be entirely consistent with this wonderful professor, Sir John Lawton, encourages us to do. He produced this report about how do you deliver more for wildlife? Well, let's have more, bigger, better, connected, protected areas. So what does that mean for Devon? Well, look, you've got some fabulous protected areas. Make them hum with wildlife. Extend them. Grow them. Argue for more land which is well managed for wildlife. And you will then be making a contribution to this great march towards greenery of the United Kingdom. And this is my illustration of what might happen if we get it right. Um, but that won't be enough either. Because 
what we found as the RSPB, and this is my final thought on this, is we have a we have a sausage machine. This is our sausage machine where we do our science, we come up with our priorities and solutions, we deliver some practical conservation, which delivers more wildlife, but we also have to do a lot more influencing. <coughs> A lot more influence those key players, decision makers, landowners, funders, faith groups, business communities. We've got to get smarter about how we influence others. Uh, and we then have also got to involve our supporters to get them to creatively work out how they can have an impact on those audiences through consumption, through voting pressure. So we've got to remember our roots. And our roots started with a bunch of, not men, join <coughs> women. Um, who actually pioneered some extraordinary campaigning. So the future of our wildlife will depend on, yes, good evidence, lots of hard work, targeted species recovery, but also really recapturing the urgency and the passion and anger that some of our foremothers and fathers had when they started great organisations like the RSPB. So we're trying our bit. We've got new campaigns going on to try and defend the, direct, the nature directors at the moment. Um, half a million people across Europe try to do just that. We want to take action on climate change. We will be mobilising people with other organisations to try and take part in the march on the 29th of November. And you know what? <coughs> Unapologetically, we will try and find ways to reach out to new audiences to try and encourage them to help us give nature a home, help to get more birds back into the Devonian landscape and make sure this extraordinary murmuration of organisations and starlings have a good future. Thank you. Martin, thank you very much. I think you only spent uh, yesterday in Devon, but you picked up on that competitive edge between Devon and Cornwall. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So not going, might, I'm not going to Cornwall for a while. So yeah, yeah. Yeah. We might still be debating how to produce a uh, cream tea, but it's nice to know that we're exporting <laughs> soil buntings to Cornwall. So thank you for that good news. Uh, questions? <coughs> you wait for the microphone, I've been reminded. <coughs> and remember, fall in love with the microphone. Well, this is a question I was going to ask the earlier speaker, but since he mentioned magpies, we might as well get it off our chest. <laughs> um, two years ago, I saw 23 magpies in my neighbour's birch tree. I've now got five in that garden and my garden who now see this as their territory. I, as, a, as a son of a former gamekeeper and brought up on a small holding in Norfolk, I'm well aware of what I can do, but what would you recommend? <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, I'll find myself time and I won't fudge it. Uh, so, what does the research say about the impact of? predation on bird populations. Uh, we did a review of all the literature that's out there in 2007, and it pretty much came to this conclusion, that of the scientific papers that have been, studies that have been done, um, there is growing evidence of the impact of predation on ground nesting birds, but populations, but there is no real correlation between the impact of predation on songbirds. So uh, we have then recently repeated that study to look at the population level impacts of predation, and pretty much the same story has emerged. That actually, yes, for ground nesting species, whether it's on the seabirds or you know, whether it's on uh, waders like lapwing, they can have a problem associated with predation. And that informs the way the RSPB applies its own policy about vertebrate control. So we have an approach which is, um, if there's a problem, and uh, we've got evidence to suggest that there's a problem, then, and if the species which is causing that venomous problem is in good conservation status, um, then we will take action, but we will start with a non-lethal approach, but we will revert to lethal action if required. So we've been led by the science, we will take action, and that's for ground nesting birds. There is still no evidence of population level impacts associated with predation and songbirds, and so we don't. You mean song thrushes are not uh, thinning out? There is no evidence to suggest that the reasons for decline is to do with predation. So cats, great example, came up earlier. Um, in London, there's a massive study about house sparrows, what's happening to the house sparrow population, and cats was one of the theories. The reality is there was no significant difference between the house sparrow population with an area which had ten times more cats than one that didn't. There was no difference. So almost certainly invertebrates, food availability, for um, bringing up young, I think, for the lack of house, but it is the big issue. Okay, thank you. 
Is this Europe? When is Europe coming up? It's um, in the long term, has any thought been given to prepare for birds that will replace the birds that are moving mm. north? And presumably at some stage you're gonna bail out as a priority on things like the ring ouzel because they'll move naturally away. But really the big question is what, what's going to replace <coughs> the movement north and, and are we thinking about how yeah, no, no, I mean, it's a great question, and we are absolutely trying to do that. So uh, we had a bunch of our ecologists, uh, they went to northern France. They told me the re reason they went to northern France was because they wanted to look at the habitat availability for some of those species that are likely to hop over the channel. I thought they were just going to join, but anyway, that's what they tell me. Um, and I think that the understanding what's, what, what's, what are those species using, um, which are on the northern march, and what, what sort of habitat do they need? And then we can start factoring that into our management planning. So one of the great successes of Avalon Marshes, which Stephen talked about, is because we are just providing this extraordinary wetland system, which some of the you know, hundreds of heron species are beginning to want to use. So um, I think is trying to predict the habitat needs of the species <coughs> on the march and keep holding on to the species which potentially are one of the because of climate change. Uh, Nigel Rendell. Um, you mentioned um, just now about having more land uh, better managed for wildlife. Um, I noticed from your first map that you've got very few RSPB reserves in Devon. Is the establishment of more RSPB reserves high on your pr priority for Devon? Uh, great, great question. So if the role of nature reserves is still absolutely fundamental part of the RSPB and probably most conservation toolkit. Um, uh, and we absolutely plan to either um, extend and buffer our existing reserves and maybe find some new ones in the future across the whole of the United Kingdom. Uh, we had this exact conversation yesterday in the pub, and I wasn't getting wet because we were a bit timid actually uh, about the weather, and we were talking about what is our ambition here. And, um, and I think, in a sense, I think that's partly a conversation for us with other organisations where we can have impact. You don't have to have land to have impact. We can work with others, we can work with farmers to do with soils. Um, but I think that, um, and it will never deliver that big landscape scale change. But my sense is that actually if you have a footprint with land, it allows you to be a player, to have a stake. Uh, and um, the new director of the South West uh, RSPB offices over there, Nick Bruce White, will have a very clear view about this. And he will, you can lobby him in two years' time if he hasn't delivered you an RSPB deserve. I think we have time for one more question. Um, take it from the lady then. Um, I wonder what, what are your theories about the decline, uh, dramatic decline of the nightingale and uh, whether there are any strategies for trying to reverse that decline because they're such an iconic bird, such an inspiration traditionally and it's tragic that uh, we're losing them and maybe almost completely, I don't know. Uh, yes, I mean, I, I, might, I might ask uh, Malcolm to say a bit more about this because I think it's one of those species where BT have done a lot of work in terms of trying to understand where they're going. Um, I think that clearly the no regrets response is to make sure that we don't build on the really strong breeding strongholds of nightingales. So let's make sure we don't do that. I think that you know, loss of available breeding habitat must be part of the reason for their decline. At the same time, um, I think that um, what's happening on migration, whether it's stop over service or whether it's uh, wintergrass, I think may well hold the um, the the, um, uh, the key. But Malcolm, I don't know if you want to just quickly just add to that. Malcolm Burgess, who does a lot of our work on our migrants, so he's just sitting behind you. Yeah, thanks. Um, yes, no, obviously there could be re uh, reasons outside the breeding grounds, and Nightingale is one species that's quite well studied. Um, in the southwest, uh, if you look at the national distribution of uh, Nightingale, you'll actually see a real contraction in range to the southeast of England. Mm -hmm. Probably one of the only species that actually does better in southeast England than, than anywhere else. And, and some people do actually point to that being a climatic effect. Uh, I'm not totally sure about that, but they, they do have very particular habitat requirements um, at different stages in their nesting cycle. And one hypothesised reason is actually a drying of soils because they, they actually feed on the ground and invertebrates under this dense scrub 
and there is a thought that, uh, that the, you know, drying, uh, which is certainly a problem in large parts of the UK, it may contribute to this. Uh, but it's one of many potential. Well, that's that's slightly counterintuitive with the southeast of England, given that we're here, a county which is quite wet. Anyway, um, <laughs> <laughs> but there are some challenges. Okay, thank you very much, Mossy. I must say.